Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are thrilled to share this uh, discussion with you about the decorative arts uh, and the market. Uh, and we have some amazing leaders from different auction houses here joining us today to share their perspective. Um, most importantly, we have our moderator, Taryn Clary, who is going to be leading this conversation. Um, Taryn is a cataloger in the 20th Century Design Department at Sotheby's New York. Prior to this, she served as a communications associate for the Decorative Arts Trust, and she has held positions at a number of New York City institutions, including Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, and R and Company. She earned a master's degree uh, in decorative arts and design history and material culture from the Bard Graduate Center. Um, and if anyone has any questions for our panelists or moderator throughout this conversation, please feel free to ask them in the chat box. There will be a Q&A at the end of our discussion today. So um, without further ado, Taryn, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for the introduction. And thank you to the Decorative Arts Trust for hosting this discussion. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, we're joined today by four auction house professionals at the very top of their fields. Uh, Tim Andriatis, Division Director of Decorative Arts and Design at Freeman's Auction. Uh, there's Tim. Lauren Brunk, Vice President of Brunk Auctions. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> uh, John Hayes, Deputy Chairman at Christie's. And then our fourth panelist, Annie Wu, uh, is director and special senior specialist of Asian art at Heinemann Auctions. And she is running from a sale, so we'll be a little bit late and hopefully join midway, um, but we'll get started without her. Uh, and as Carrie mentioned, feel free to send your questions to the chat box throughout, uh, and we'll leave time at the end to address them. Uh, so the last time I spoke with all of you actually uh, was for the trust blog uh, in the late summer of 2020, which some of our viewers may have uh, checked out, basically to reflect on how your business is adapted to the closure of in person auctions, and how buyers quarantined in their homes responded to buying and selling art online. Uh, so now about one year later, as restrictions are beginning to ease, uh, what are your observations on the decorative arts market. Uh, maybe we can start with Tim. Sure. Thanks, Taryn. And I just wanted to say a, a thank you to Carrie and Matt for organizing today's panel and uh, for inviting inviting me to participate. So, uh, you know, I think if you had asked me and, and maybe others of us as well back in uh, February or March of last year, what the result was going to be of the, the pandemic, I, I think there was a lot of fear, obviously, around the, the virus, but there was a lot of concern for our consigners about what the state of the market would be presenting their, their property um, in an environment where people may not necessarily be paying as much attention to collecting and spending their money on, on art and, uh, and decorative objects. What, what we found actually is that uh, quite, quite the opposite sort of happened. We, we postponed our, our uh, sort of marquee design auction for about three weeks. And when we had the sale, the participation was really at two or three times the level of participation that we would have expected pre-pandemic. And I, I think there's a couple of different factors going on there. I think uh, in, in one way supply has been down because I think a lot of collectors, uh, perhaps rightly so, were a little hesitant about presenting their, their material on the market. And I, I think also with people kind of hunkered down at home, uh, there's a lot more time maybe to kind of think about what do I want to be collecting? What do I want to be surrounding myself with in my home? Um, so even though global sales from 2019 to 2020 were, were down about 30% to something like 17.6 billion, we actually saw you know, tremendous interest over the course of the last 12 months um, in all of our auctions, just tremendous levels of participation and uh, I think one of the things that the, the pandemic has sort of clarified is that uh, at Freeman's, and I suspect this may be the case elsewhere, is that it's sort of ramped up uh, plans for engaging digitally that may already have been in the work. So we redid our website. Uh, we've created e-catalogs so that clients can engage with property in, in ways that maybe they can't in traditional print media. So we've, we've really looked at how we can expand in the digital sphere. And, and so far, the, the response from clients has been really positive, whether 
we're running sales um, either virtually as live auctions or as online only time sales. Uh, clients seem to be responding really positively. And, you know, the proof is, is in the pudding. I mean, there's just across the board uh, records uh, for every category during this past year. And, you know, you could talk, I suppose, larger macroeconomics as to why that might be the case with, with uh, certain sectors having that, that kind of money to spend. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say auction houses really haven't been, been hurting, at least, at least we haven't at, at Freeman's figuring out how we're gonna adjust to, uh, to doing things so virtually. Um, so it's been, it's been interesting. Did you find the same uh, at Brunk, Lauren? I, I did, and sort of, you know, as Tim said, it, it was not so much that we were putting new uh, processes in place, but we were accelerating processes that were already there, whether it was online platforms or digital catalogs or, um, you know, we, we also have seen that it's been, the sales have been very strong and um, different categories are doing better than others, but we'll, we'll touch on that later, I think. Um, and I think that one of the things that has been really important for us in the process is the, you know, sort of trust building with our with our clients who have not been able to physically come here. And so what that means is rather than, you know, the doors fly open and everybody comes in and walks around and you might talk with someone, you might not, they might just make their own decision, they might look on their own. Right now, what we're seeing is that we're engaging personally with, with clients um, in a much more in, intensive way. Um, and I think that will serve us well in the future. It will be hard to sustain because it's um, it can take a lot of time, but I think that once you have this kind of communication with a potential buyer and they um, have a level of trust in how you've cataloged it. Like, what does your cataloging mean? What, what, you know, where can you find these extra images? Are they already there? You know, learning how to use the digital resources. It's been, you know, it's been really great. And I think, you know, a lot of us that work in the decorative arts think we have a slightly older, you know, demographic and that maybe there's some barrier to entry in terms of technology and the use of technology. But as it turns out, that's really not the case either. And that, you know, folks are, you know, yeah, it took 10 minutes to learn how to do the first Zoom, but once you got over the hump, you know, um, you know, it's the, the gates have been open. So I think that we're, you know, the market has been strong and I think it's really helped us boost our, you know, connection with, with people in a, in a way that I think will be good. Yeah. Um, you actually touched on one of the questions I wanted to discuss um, uh, is that there have been a lot of headlines about how uh, millennials are increasingly uh, beginning to acquire art, especially during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, how have the demographics for your departments changed, if that's significant, or if it really is, you know, clients uh, adapting. So maybe, John, you could speak to that on the American Furniture and Decorative Arts uh, client side at Christie's. Well, I'd also like to thank the Decorative Arts Trust for inviting us to do this. Thank you very much. And I'd respond to Lauren first and say it took me more than 10 minutes to actually learn how to Zoom. <laughs> and uh, uh, some people would say I still haven't, but uh, I'm figuring it out. I'm alone in my apartment in New York City and uh, managed to be communicating. So that's a huge advancement for this dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would say to answer your question that uh, Christie's is embracing so many changes right now that uh, uh, we're kind of uh, breathless. It's for, for a large, the largest auction house in the world for, for a decade, uh, the pandemic, uh, I think, caught us a little bit more off guard than we'd probably like to admit in most circles, but, but uh, that meant we had to pivot in almost every direction. Uh, the millennial question that you raise is, uh, is already yesterday's news. Uh, today we're dealing with uh, cryptocurrencies and we're dealing with uh, people with monikers like uh, Beeples and, and uh, trying to come online with um, uh, a great deal of change. And I think uh, Lauren is right. Uh, the perception in decorative arts is that it's sort of an old stodgy field. And in reality, um, what's interesting for, for us, 
in the decorative arts as, as a you know, broad collecting area. Um, it used to be that, that it was the amount of money people had uh, as their entry point into these markets. And now we're experiencing uh, the ability to embrace through technology uh, a whole new group of collectors, not just millennials, but uh, actually older people uh, as well. So I would say uh, it, in an optimistic way, we, we're, we're, we're looking at the entire, not just the community of decorative arts as we used to know it, the, the people who got your catalog, the people who would show up to your sales. We are now having conversations with people who we don't even know uh, about objects. And um, on the one hand, it's very encouraging. On the other hand, Lauren used the word trust. It takes years, I think, to build up a trusting relationship with people that they can buy and bid on things without having seen it. And in this instance, I think uh, we'll be very grateful when we can get back to communing together where we can uh, see people socially and have fun uh, learning about our fields. Uh, that is the way forward in, 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 on the trust issue. But right now, I would say our uh, online sales uh, are many multiples of the numbers of people who were bidding uh, in our previous uh, uh, life uh, of a year ago. So uh, we're now joined by Annie. Uh, Annie Wu from Heinemann. Welcome. Hopefully your sale today went well. <laughs> um, yeah, as well um, as that expanded uh, audience demographic wise, uh, the digital outreach uh, initiatives have also led to a much more globalized market, which is something as well that's been developing and accelerated by uh, the past year. So what markets do you see growing the fastest and how are you approaching them? Um, maybe Annie, we'll start with you, have you jump in. Sorry, I'm still um, organizing my notes. Can you repeat the question again? Oh, sure, that, um, that digital outreach has led to a more globalized market. So what markets are growing the fastest for your department and how are you approaching them? I think the definitely the fastest uh, growth market is still the Chinese works of art market. Um, I think um, thanks to the internet, um, all our buyers are looking um, the sell online, so we will be able to reach them very quickly. Um, and also, um, because of COVID, I think um, a lot of the Asian art buyers, specifically Chinese art buyers, um, they are looking at digital marketing and rely on digital marketing a lot. So we've switched our direction, shifted our direction a little bit towards digital marketing. And we started working with a lot of bloggers or uh, digital newspapers based in Asia. Um, and particularly when nowadays, a lot of the younger generation, they're always looking at their phone um, right now. So they are they, they subscribe to a lot of the bloggers and digital magazines. Um, and we utilize that uh, resource and we, will be, we are able to reach a lot of the, um, those collectors. Um, uh, you know, even though it's a difficult times right now, but we do see a surge in um, the, uh, the, in the number of the internet bidders. So that is really um, great for my market in particular. Wonderful. And uh, Tim and Lauren, any, any response to the globalized market? Um, I would, I would just, just add that, you know, we are, we are, you know, kind of realizing it at Freeman's as, as we have for, for many years now that, you know, you can't be everything to, to everyone. So, we've really tried to double down on, on areas that we have historic strength in, whether it be sort of Pennsylvania art and design, uh, American and Bucks County impressionists, um, and sort of bringing those markets, which have been, been growing, you know, at sort of a steady rate of about 15% every year, really bringing those markets to, to new areas. So, you know, probably, you know, every six months or so, when I have another big design auction, we have new bidders for George Nakashima, you know, who was uh, very active in, in the New Hope area, not, not far from where I live here. And, um, you know, so we have new bidders in, in Asia and in Europe, um, Australia. So we're, we're really focused on kind of bringing some of the, the local regional art that, that we work with to those international audiences and helping 
helping really build that. But I think on the other side of that coin, I'm, I'm certain others can speak to this, is that the globalization of the market has kind of, um, you know, helped to canonize a lot of art that uh, is, is selling so historically well, you know, like, you yeah, know, Basquiat and, um, you know, uh, street art. And really, I think there's a number of kind of blue chip collectors that like having that, that trophy in their, in their collection. And I, and I think the challenge for those of us who are working in historically, um, you know, different markets is, is sort of, figuring out how to reinvigorate those markets and, and show them in ways that are, that are really interesting for, for new audiences. And, and I think the, the sort of narrative power around, um, around collectors and collecting, I, I think is really interesting to a, to a younger generation of buyers um, who, who would like to participate and are looking for, for various entry points. So I think that's something we all kind of are continuing to try to, to, to present to people as we, as we bring these auctions online. I can sort of dovetail a little bit um, with what Tim said with regard to sort of catering to your strength. And um, so, you know, we have strength here in, um, in furniture. Um, and while, uh, you know, Southern furniture isn't you know, the only thing we do, we do it really well. And so that we have seen a great strength in that market and also sort of a growing um, collecting field there as there's more, um, more writing, more symposia, more um, academic uh, effort put in the direction of looking at objects and paintings for that matter uh, from the Southeast. So we're in a great position to be able to support that. Uh, so that's nice. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're seeing it sort of trickle out of the region as, as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things in, in terms of um, uh, strengths also, I think, as Tim said, the, the recognizable artists for people that are new collectors, it's rare that you see them, you know, jump to the deep end of the pool. So if somebody is thinking they might want to start collecting in a certain area, they're very likely to start with somebody who is recognizable. And I think that there's a long history there, uh, back to the days that we don't see quite as much anymore, where, where social groups, they, they went to antique shows together, they went antiquing together, they went to you know, the Williamsburg Forum together, and then they had dinner parties and they showed each other what they got. Um, there's less of that. And so I think that when you, you do have that statement item, it's, it's gonna be recognizable, it's gonna be a good one. So going in kind of strong right from the beginning with recognizable, good quality, I think that's something that we're seeing also. Mm -hmm. um, John, you touched on this a little bit, but, uh, but Christie's made headlines with that $69 million sale of the non-fungible token JPEG file. So uh, kind of building on the conversation of you know, how we're attracting collectors to decorative arts market. Uh, what do you think that signals for us working in the very you know, physical realm of objects? And do you foresee a more widespread adoption of cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain authentication for all auction houses across categories? John? I think, I think we lost you on mute. <laughs> There you go. How's that? There Perfect. we go. It just shows you how technology uh, efficient <laughs> I am. Uh, so, yes, this has occupied uh, a, a lot of uh, hours, uh, uh, personal hours, as I've, as I, all of us in the whole art community, in the whole country, in the world, try to get up to speed on cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think uh, everybody has a metaphor for what what this is. Uh, there's a there's a negative and a positive, uh, and uh, I hear uh, very strong uh, opinions on both sides of this in terms of our business and, and the future. For me, I, the metaphor that that I would like to use is is now provenance, uh, which really isn't a tangible thing, uh, and it, it never has been. That, that this is history and 
you, you prove it through words and maybe you know documents that are linking it, but it's nothing that you hang on the wall. You don't hang provenance on the wall. You, you hang the work of art on the wall. And so now we've seen the ultimate uh, uh, non-tangible sort of shocking pur purchase uh, of something that is the Wild West. And I'm, I remember, since I'm, uh, many of your viewers will remember this as well, when the internet first came on, nobody knew exactly what that was. We, it was a new thing. And uh, I remember when cell phones were a new thing and, and my, first, my first cell phone conversation. And you know, it's sort of like being a 16 year old getting the keys to the car. And, and you, you just don't, you know, you don't know where you want to go, but you, but you have the keys to the car and it's very exciting because, you know, you have this power, but where it's going to go, I think is, is very much up in the air because it's a, it's a public uh, domain and very unregulated. And so those of us that are in the art world that have spent years doing that famous thing called KYC, you know, your client to make sure that your clients were able to pay and who they were and money laundering and all those questions. None of that seems to be a, a major part of the cryptocurrency uh, thing. So we're going to see a, a bumpy ride, I think, for cryptocurrency and, and, and non-fungible tokens. We're going to see, uh, it, there's an excellent uh, podcast the New York Times did uh, interviewing Mike Winkleman, who's uh, the people's uh, artist, uh, uh, that's his moniker. He self describes this space as is it, 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 it seems to, to, to be going uh, in a direction that nobody, nobody will know. Will it, will it last? Nobody knows the answers to any of this. There's a great deal of uh, uh, money tied up in, in cryptocurrency and, and yet it's, it is the wild west. So I think Christie's maybe two steps ahead of everybody else because a 25 year old in the uh, first open sale uh, had the idea of, of taking this on, got approvals and um, uh, a little you know, look behind the curtain at Christie's. Uh, I think uh, the, the old guard and old guard meaning the 26 year olds and up uh, uh, were learning very quickly about this space and what a drop was and what, what, the, what the vernacular is in, in, in this space. I would say that, that no, I don't think it's going to, um, I, th I think it's having a very, you know, every day there's a newspaper article on, on the subject. And as you read, and uh, in my case, having to read it two or three times to try to understand uh, uh, the meaning of, of this whole space, you, you do realize that a lot of it has nothing to do with art. It's, it's, it's another platform on which we will see Definitely, like the internet, we will see uses that uh, will be very helpful to perhaps the art world, perhaps not. But right now, Christie's is uh, uh, planning their next sale uh, in the video space. Uh, I think I think a thousand ideas are coming in a day, and uh, all but two or three of them are rejected immediately because it's it's a scary uh, uh, and non-starting kind of uh, thing. But uh, several ideas could work, and, and music and video, and you can think of the artists who've been involved in that. Things that are not tangible uh, can, that can be on the blockchain, and, and understanding finally that the millennials that you referred to uh, in your first question uh, seem to be very uh, excited about n having the ownership of something and not. Hot, you know, not letting the world share it, but the more people that have it, the better. So that that's a very big change in the art world, where where the idea uh, of the owning the provenance, but having the whole world having access to it, is is a dynamic thing for them. So we are going forward carefully, but um, I think um, if if the whole thing uh, ended. Uh, uh, by the end of this year, that that would be uh, a possibility, uh, just as much as it becoming coming online and being having a very useful function for all of the auction houses and and the art market to uh, regulate and once regulation and things uh, creep into it. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that from the other auction houses?
we are we are not accepting cryptocurrency yet. Um, we're waiting to see how it goes for John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, I, what, I would like to add then that that Mike Winkleman, as he said in his podcast, took his sixty nine million dollars and that night turned it into U.S. dollars. So even the artist Without. himself yeah. uh, is as a, is as a uncertain yeah. of the future of this space as, as anyone else. However, yeah. uh, uh, we took our commission in dollars too, by the way, not in not cryptocurrency. <laughs> you might wish you took it in cryptocurrency at some point. But I mean, there was a time where we thought it was crazy to sell you know, skateboards and sneakers um, and that just seems so run of the mill now, you know, relatively speaking, like, you know, you could have these Jordans, you know, for a hundred thousand dollars, or you could have this desk for a hundred thousand, like, which one would you want? That, that is, it's so old news, you know, like that was a year or two years ago. And now it's sort of absurd. You know, there's, there's a sneaker department, right, John, did I see that? I mean, it's we're a actually s- We're selling George Washington skateboard. Uh, uh, next gen or we have it yeah yeah but i think john your point about a certain category of buyer that looks at ownership in a very different way and you know whether that's you know open code or you know whether it's a non-fungible token that you know the concept of sort of fewer better things um you know, maybe getting a little ahead of the question, but it's, that seems to be the way that's going. Great. Uh, Well, kind of shifting topic here, um, another development in the art world as a whole, and particularly the museum field, uh, we've been experiencing heightened focus on diversity and inclusivity initiatives, you know, which are extremely important um, and long overdue. Uh, so is this something you're noticing in the auction field? Uh, and if so, what efforts are being made at your auction houses and what can continue to be uh, improved upon? Who wants to start first? <laughs> um, I would like to start because um, I, I think it's a, such an interesting topic. Um, I think in overall, I think to me, auction is a very traditional um, business. And throughout the years, I've seen a, quite a bit of changes. Um, and, you know, my auction house, Hyman in particular, um, we've done a lot to, um, you know, notice, we noticed the, the, the change, uh, the trend. And, you know, we, um, for, particularly for my department, I think we've done a lot. And particularly for my department, we embrace all the all the employee, particularly the employees from various backgrounds. Um, and, uh, you know, take my department for an example, um, myself and another uh, specialist, we are, you know, originally from um, Asia country. And then we also have um, two more staff with various backgrounds. Um, and we also have uh, employees at, the, at our client service department, the business development department, um, property department, we all, you know, are, we are all from very different backgrounds. So um, I think it's certainly it, it's a, a good trend. And uh, we also want to, uh, you know, do more, uh, do more work in, in that category. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, oh, do we lose Tim? Perhaps. <laughs> um, Lauren, did you want to speak on that in Brunk at all? Or? Um, I, I sort of only got the first, but I think you were asking about um, looking at diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for us, one of the things that is sort of uh, most uh, forward is looking at representation of um, slavery, uh, since that's such a big part of the history of the South. And I, I catalog Southern paintings. So, um, and at one point, uh, so like in the 90s, I worked at Sotheby's doing folk art. We approached the imagery so very differently at that time than we do now. What is considered okay to sell? Can you, can you offer something that has this direct relationship with an enslaved person? Um, is that problematic? Is that okay? And 
you know, that's something that each auction house decides for them for themselves, because there might be somebody who wants to own this thing to sort of keep it safe. But, you know, for us, I think we increasingly are making judgments about something that is um, presents imagery that uh, would be problematic, you know, if you are somebody that was dis descended or somehow connected with, with slaveholding. So we're having to sort of navigate that a little bit and maybe err on the side of just, we just don't, you know, um, there's a lot of things that we might have sold 10 years ago that we, we probably wouldn't today. Uh, welcome back, Tim. <laughs> I see now. Um... Hi, sorry. Oh, it's so no windy problem. here, but losing power. <laughs> Technical difficulties all across the board for, you know, all of COVID. <laughs> um, I see now that we're uh, a little bit past halfway. Uh, so would love to hear uh, from maybe Tim first sharing a story uh, from sale that surprised you or what category of art uh, you're seeing that's doing really well um, or perhaps, you know, performed worse than you anticipated. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like everything this year has been such a such a surprise and, and, and been kind of unexpected. We just had a sale on Tuesday of this week where uh, we sold a, a set of Nakashima uh, production furniture. So for those of you who know Nakashima, he has a studio and they've, they've been producing pieces up until George's death in, in 1990. But in the late 50s, he he joined hand with with Whitaker home furniture and they they made these production pieces well sort of lo long long story short um you know they they they, they brought like twenty one thousand dollars against an estimate of four to six which if you know that the nakashima market that's extremely strong for any type of production uh nakashima like that so i think it just goes to show i mean it's it's back to this idea that, that buyers are really interested in name brand and i think sort of kind of old school questions around craftsmanship and, um, you know, rarity and, uh, and all of that are, are maybe not quite as important to, to today's group of collectors who, are, who again, I think they, they want those sort of growth, they want the name, they want the design, but they may not be quite as focused on uh, sort of other uh, considerations when it comes to collecting. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, maybe you next. A story that surprised you? Well, uh, I, I know the theme is uh, uh, and has to be, and Chrissy wants to be at the forefront of, of, of inclusion and diversity, and and uh, every single thing that we're that we're doing uh, that is a top a topic that gets addressed at the beginning of the meeting and the end of the meeting, and you know it's pretty impressive to see this old English firm, you know, going through the paces there and. Uh, so the surprise for me, in part, uh, I happen to be a big fan of George Washington, uh, as we all are. And, you know, there was a curiosity about how he would do in the marketplace in January, because as a founding father and uh, some of the founding fathers have, you know, taken a bit of a beating in, in recent times. But we set a record with uh, a James Sharples uh, pastel uh, of, of Washington, a, a marvelous little, little picture. Um, and it was bid uh, on by um, at least 15 different groups, one of which was a mainland Chinese buyer going to our uh, embracing the internet. And uh, so I guess I'm very, very encouraged uh, about uh, someone who I feel very you know, strongly about uh, to see the, the interest continuing and growing and growing, uh, albeit um, one has to look at all of this, uh, as as Lauren said, differently. I think I think the world is looking at it differently. We are, but but as an American, uh, to beat the drum a little bit here, uh, I think the the experiment called America is still very exciting for everyone. And when we look at things in context, uh, as long as we're able to tell that story and be and uh, be upfront, we're, we're we're seeing that uh, the interest in some of the uh, uh, traditional areas. Uh, are, are just as strong. Was it a surprise? Um, I didn't know what to expect um, 
because uh, we only, you know, the data you get from our sales is, you know, episodic as we go through these, these sale periods. But um, uh, once again, uh, it, it looks like uh, there are many people who who are deeply interested in in the experiment called America and what was happening at that time, and that's very encouraging uh, in that space for for me personally. Um, Annie and Lauren, any uh, objects or segments of the market that surprised you? Um, if I can talk about the Chinese was about sell that we had yesterday, um, it was a huge success. They are um, two very surprised, uh, good surprise lots that we sold yesterday. Um, bulk of lots are Chinese paintings. Um, the first one is um, a painting album, which is comprised of five album leaves. They're not very large, about an A4 size um, Chinese painting. We have five of them. And that one was hammered at $140,000. Um, a second one is a larger painting uh, with, uh, with a signature of a Southern Song Dynasty um, artist. And that painting was hammered at $200,000. Um, the first painting, uh, the first, first painting album, I believe we had originally had an estimate of ten to twenty thousand. Um, the second larger painting, we had an estimate of thirty to fifty thousand um, dollar. So all the estimates are very conservative. Um, we were anticipating that they'll likely sell above the range a little bit, with, but we didn't realize that they were that popular. Um, you know, after the sale, um, I did a lot of research and did a lot of thinking. Um, I think the main reason uh, are, you know, first of all, of course, the estimates are very conservative, conservative and attractive to our buyers. Um, and second of all, um, they came from very good estates. Um, they have a lot of history behind the paintings. Um, and I think the most importantly is that um, all the paintings have numerous collector seals on them. And uh, it's not that, um, I guess it's not very easy to um, figure out what the seals are, um, but because we've spent, I'd say we spent probably two months, uh, me and my team spent two months studying the seals and we were able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, conclude that um, really a clear history behind the paintings from, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, who was the first collector, um, who was the last collector of these paintings, and uh, we can, you know, connect the dots and present uh, the paintings together with very strong provenance and very uh, strong history behind the paintings. I think, uh, you know, all combined, we were able to get uh, such a high price, but certainly very good surprises yesterday. That's wonderful. I mean, all those elements definitely add up worth the two months of, of research. That's great. Congratulations. I, I think, um, you know, the idea of finding that history, you know, as John said, whether it's, you know, blockchain or uh, provenance, well-established provenance, I, I think if we're looking at strength in the market, something that we have seen, you um, is the importance of a well-established and a well-known collection. So a few months ago, we, we sold a collection that was classical, the bank's sale. Um, and that's a, that's a segment of the market that traditionally, you know, for Americana collectors has felt a little soft uh, in recent years. Um, and so, of course, these were these were great things, but you you never know. And going into an auction, you, there's only so much as an auctioneer that you can tell. You can see that people are curious. You can see that they're watching, but you don't know what they're going to do. So, um, with that sale, we were completely astounded at the at the prices um, for those things. I mean, there was maybe a height in the market, and John, you can correct me, but would you say like? in the 90s maybe would be sort of a height for neoclassical things in the Americana market. Um, well, I, 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 we, we tip our hat to you guys. I think, I think clearly the provenance and the, uh, the nature of a, of, of, a, of a collector's eye shows the importance yeah. uh, of material, no matter what category it is. And, and uh, I think 
there was that uh, you, you guys drilled it down into that, you know, beautifully. And, and uh, so I would say the, the uh, uh, sp sparse amount of material that's coming on the market uh, probably was in your favor too. And you successfully pivoted uh, at the very early days of, of, of COVID yeah. uh, and you were very nimble. And I think all that paid off. And I think uh, classical, uh, Furniture, we 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 have noticed an uptick in that yeah. in that category too, as well. Yeah, so, so that was that was actually a whole sale that was a surprise. You know, rather a very pleasant surprise. I mean, it was wonderful, but there are plenty of times where you have a great object that you love, and it has a great story, and there's something fabulous about it, and you might that might not be met with the same regard in the market. Uh, and you just have to get over that because <laughs> it happens. Um, but I will say the other thing that's been um, strong and surprising is for us like very specific regionalism. Um, so whether it's like, uh, you know, low country, uh, South Carolina or Georgia, or, um, you know, it might be Pennsylvania, but being able to understand very specifically where something came from and possibly who made it, that, that is, um, that's something that catches the attention of the market. And there are, we see people that are collecting very specifically in terms of their regional preferences. Um, and, uh, and they are in this category, really they are looking for, that quality, that maker, the patina, that they are looking at the dovetails. They are, uh, you know, they do want to know, was every single board original? You know, we don't want to take the top off, but maybe we do take the top off because that is going to be the, the thing that determines, is this a $20,000 table or is it a $150,000 table? Um, the the cream is is definitely is there with, with those really well-preserved, you know, well-loved, un, un, um, interrupted, you know, objects that have, that haven't been, haven't been repaired. And there, you know, there are not that many of them out there, but they, they still come up, but that, that really, um, you know, clean and specific identifiable thing is, is really going to create some excitement. Mm -hmm. And you know, you said you can't really predict uh, what's going to do well, even when you have your heart set on it. Um, but uh, to wrap up before our Q and A, I would love for each of you to uh, give you know a brief forecast, uh, if you will, for the decorative arts market for the remainder of 2021 and beyond. Um, well, I'll go first. I guess uh, I'll just say that uh, we are not quite through uh, the COVID uh, uh, challenges. And we are finding uh, as a firm that the American markets are still um, a, a little bit gun shy still for the spring sales, which means that the future forecast for the fall is actually, uh, and next January, enormous. So we're, 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 we're experiencing this, this uh, delay, whereas our European colleagues and perhaps it's because Europe has opened a little, you know, earlier. I'm not sure if that's been good or bad, but it has been very strong in our in our European markets. So the American markets are looking forward to a very busy fall and an extremely busy January. I would just I would agree with John, and I I think that if you you know if you do want to look at the economics of it, um, you know the recovery. Uh, on the one hand, there's a whole segment of the population for which there is no recovery. They, they're, um, they have been fine. Their, you know, personal resources haven't suffered, and um, and those folks are will probably continue to um, buy actively and and strong uh, with strong numbers. I think where you really see uh, things falling off is at the mid range. So anything that's a, you know, even a B plus and down, uh, there's more of it. It's harder to sell. Um, people have, have to sort of recalibrate their expectations uh, for that segment of the market. So as has always been the case, yes, of course you want the A plus, 
but and I do think that the the idea of, of just you know one or two great things where you can really throw your resources at something that's at the at the top of the um, quality scale or desirability scale, I think that's that seems to be where I would suspect it will go. I think the Asian market overall will remain quite stable. Um, you know, at, even before COVID, we did a lot of um, ourselves and a lot of marketing through the internet. Um, and of course, with COVID, um, I think people won't be able to travel outside those Asian countries, but um, they can still uh, manage the sales with the use of the internet. So I do think that the Asian market will remain stable. Um, and I, I've been, no, I've been noticing that maybe the Japanese and Korean market will pick up a little bit. Oh. Um, we've been saying for so long that um, the Japanese and Korean market have been very soft. Um, but, you know, even with myself today, uh, I, I see that the middle range uh, decorative art is selling very well at this point. Um, I think it will, it will pick up shortly and it will, Still, it's not back entirely yet, uh, but I think there are people who um, are uh, who, who who are ready to uh, you know uh, look into these two categories, uh, you know, throughout this year and even going towards the next year. I would probably agree also um, that I think you're going to see a lot of uh, cross category exploration, I think moving into um, in, through this year and, and next year, I think a lot of collectors are more willing maybe than they have been in the past to explore new categories of, of collecting. And I think you're gonna see record prices in, in just about every category. I think it's gonna continue to happen for Americana. I think it's gonna continue to happen for European decorative arts, I think, um, I think what Christie's did actually with rebranding of, of old masters in, into masters is really smart. And I think that, you know, the proof is in the, in the pudding there um, with, with the results that, that they have achieved. So I, I think it, it's really figuring out how you kind of rebrand a lot of these old markets to, to new audiences. And, um, and, and I think that, that we'll continue to see really, really strong numbers throughout the year. Right back at you, Tim. We, we learned uh, that the regional auction houses were ahead of us on, on developing and launching that because perhaps because they had to in order to compete with the New York firms. But uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, I look forward to getting together with everybody. And I would just one comment to Annie's uh, uh, sale. Uh, the Christie's sales saw uh, Chinese furniture hit a whole new level. Uh, and uh, that's quite staggering under the circumstances that we're in. So I, there's a lot of bright light uh, uh, in the marketplace. Wonderful. Well, I'll turn it over to Carrie, who I believe is taking the Q&A. Hi, thank you all so much. That was incredibly insightful. Um, and we have a few questions that are very specific. Um, so please feel free to step in with an answer if you have one. And Taryn, I hope you can jump in to take some of these as well. Um, so first we have uh, a participant whose ceramics collection is one that I definitely want to see. It sounds incredible. Um, so their question is about the French ceramics that they collect from 1925 to 48. And they note that these uh, ceramics from this period, particularly European ceramics from this period, don't perform as well as glass pieces. Um, and they are wondering why there might be that discrepancy. So why glass is performing better than uh, ceramics? That's out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> Maybe I can take this. I, I think, um, you know, the, the market for a lot of deco material in that, that period is, is sort of down at, at the moment. But um, I think one of the reasons why uh, things like Galet and Dolm and, and, and some of the sort of better, uh, better glass in that area continues to do well. And, and you see actually Sotheby's has an upcoming sale with, with, with really a nice group of it. Um, I think what, what you have there is there's a lot of crossover with, with Tiffany buyers uh, buyers who collect Tiffany glass 
And so I think that has really helped buoy that that market. Perhaps Taryn can speak more to it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, and it is true that that uh, a lot of the ceramics, um, you know, even names like Henri Semen and uh, Boutal, they they just have not achieved numbers that they were achieving even even ten or twenty or certainly thirty. 30 years ago, but uh, there's certainly an interest in, in post-war French ceramics like Georges Juve and, and Jacques and Danny Ruland and, and, and those bits seem to kind of come up at all the major major design sales. So, but you know, these things are cyclical. So um, if, if you, it sounds like you have a really, a really nice collection now, may, may be a time just to double down and uh, you may find that there's, there's great buys to be had uh, as, you know, maybe, curators and, and other sort of thought leaders in uh, in that field maybe are, are planning exhibitions that can kind of get get new people interested in that type of material but it's a very interesting observation and and a good one um and we have a question about the american decorative arts uh field um do you find that new buyers are trying to fill their houses or just buying an occasional piece? Well, uh, I guess the short answer to that is, it, uh, is, is both. You, you are seeing the competition for wall space uh, has, I think, hurt the case pieces, the, you know, the secretaries and the high chests and things like that, because collectors are thrilled to get a great piece of American furniture if it's under the dado. But once you're up above the dado, then you're competing with the contemporary art uh, surge here, where a, and, and we are seeing people mixing contemporary art with, with Americana. So I definitely would say uh, that the, the collector who fills their house in a period room setting where everything had to be, uh, you know, uh, of the period and, and Matt, that cut, which I thought was really, you know, cool and uh, dovetailed with architecture and housing, that period has shifted now to this eclectic across the board of all, all categories. So to what Tim was saying earlier, we really, we really are seeing uh, across all categories, not just American decorative arts, individual specimen pieces at the top of the market yeah. mixed with other areas. Yeah, I would agree, John. We, we see that as well. It's very unusual to find someone who is collecting across the board at a particular, even regionally. I mean, there are a few that, you know, um, someone who might be trying to represent a, a region where they live. Um, there are not that many of those. I, and I think there used to be a lot more. And, and people really have embraced the idea of, of you know, mix and match. Um, and having, having really interesting um, pieces in different categories. And it, it is a little, it's a, a little bit of a shift in the idea of, of kind of connoisseurship and how that, how that works as a, as a collector, whether it's this kind of broad sweep of understanding a whole time period, um, or whether it's understanding sort of deeply one particular object. And I think it's, it's sort of moved to the latter. Oh, yeah. It's a really fascinating shift. Um, and we only have time for a couple more questions. Um, so I wanna be respectful of all of our panelists time. I know you're incredibly busy. Um, this is a very specific one. How strong is the market for 17th and 18th century European ceramics? Is it stronger or weaker now than it was five years ago? Well, the short answer I think from Christie's would be it was very quiet that market and then the Rockefellers uh, sale came along and it just went off the charts going to uh, I think uh, the panelists point that it's about provenance and the collectors and if you have a big name and uh, you see Martha Stewart holding up European ceramics uh, it, it embraced a whole new group of collectors that and and that's what's happened for us the internet the the time that we're in we're, we're now we're now seeing people we, we don't know. And it's a lot less, a uh, little less snobby, the art world. Uh, it's embracing the world and that's positive for European ceramics. And then to wrap it up, I'm going to ask, um, someone inquired, why do you think classicism has increased in popularity? And I guess the first part of that question is, do you think classicism has increased in popularity? 
Um, and if so, why? You're muted, Lauren. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I think some classicism has, you know, increased in popularity, but again, it's at the very top um, of the category, I would say. Um, John, what do you what do you think about that? I think we're we're watching it unfold in front of us. It's having a, a renaissance, and I, I think it's. It, it was quiet though for, for decades. So maybe as Tim was saying, these are all cyclical markets and uh, it's having a, you know, you can still get a great piece of classical furniture. It's very hard to get a, a great piece of uh, uh, 18th century uh, material. So maybe it may be supply driven as much as anything. I, I think too, that there's a lot of, um, a lot of interest in, in postmodern design like Memphis um, with, Ettore Sotsas and Michael Graves and, and those folks that are referencing uh, classicism. And I, I think there's a, a very playful way that, that they're doing it, obviously, that I think appeals to a lot of uh, a lot of new collectors. So and I and I don't quite know, you know, who, who the collectors are for the sort of earlier 19th century or, or late 18th century material uh, in my field. But um, but I suspect people because I myself have found myself looking at those pe those pieces with fresh eyes, um, that there, that the, there may be ways to relate to those pieces in in a way that perhaps feels more contemporary be because they have twentieth and even twenty first century reference points in ways that well I guess you could look at uh, Robert Venturi's Chippendale chair, but perhaps perhaps less so in in sort of other areas. That's really interesting. Um, and I want to start off my thank you <laughs> to Freemans who sponsored this panel discussion. So thank you to them. And also thank you to each of our incredible panelists. This has been a fascinating discussion and you all have brought such a breadth and depth of, I mean, in experience um, that has been invaluable. I hope everybody who uh, participated uh, was able to hear uh, as much of the discussion as possible. If you missed anything, don't worry because you registered, you will receive a link to a recording of this presentation in about a week. Um, and we look forward to sharing it with you. Um, and if you want to uh, see more Decorative Arts Trust programming, be sure to check out our YouTube page and click subscribe. The more subscribers we have, the more people we reach. So we greatly appreciate it. And also thank you to Taryn. This would not have been possible without you and your wonderful questions and wonderful moderating. Um, I know you're new to Sotheby's, but I'm excited to see all of the amazing work that you do there. So um, thank you everybody. And I hope you all have a lovely weekend and enjoy a little bit of spring. So see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.